that we talk about uh, is the resolution of the camera. Resolution. Resolution. Uh, and back in the analog days, back in the analog days, all cameras, all cameras had been standardized in the United States uh, to shoot 525 lines of resolution. All right, and so for the longest amount of time, uh, essentially from the very end of World War II up until about 2007 or so, uh, you know that it was standard. It was absolutely standard that every single camera that was in use in the United States in the television production industry was a 525 line camera. Now, not all of those lines were visible. All right, so if you can picture an old school TV set, do you remember what they look like? Do you remember how the front glass was curved? Remember how it was curved? Well, some of the lines on the top and some of the lines on the bottom were cut off. All right, so a 525 line signal was not truly 525 lines visible. It was 480 lines visible, all right? So you could see 480 lines. Does that make sense? So when we converted from analog to digital, when we converted from analog to digital, one of the very first setups for resolution was 480 lines, all right? 480 lines. And that 480 comes to us from that 525 line standard, which was the analog standard. Does that make sense? And in fact, this is still what we call SD TV, standard definition television. SD TV is standard definition television. All right, 480 lines visible. And in fact, how many of you remember, and probably you guys grew up with, DVDs, yeah? Standard DVDs, not Blu-ray, but just regular run-of-the-mill DVDs. Well, this is the DVD, the standard DVD standard, okay? Does that make sense? The normalized DVD standard, all right? So, 480 lines of resolution. But, of course, the, the, the uh, exciting thing about digital television was this new thing. Okay, HD TV, HD TV, high definition television, high definition television. And so the very definition of this, <coughs> all right, is anything more than 480 lines qualifies as high definition. Anything more than 480 lines really qualifies as high definition. Does that make sense? So, two standards, two standards emerged very quickly for high definition. 720 lines, 720 lines, and 1080. 1080. So, What's kind of funny about this is if you really think about it, you know, from the end of World War II all the way up until, you know, the mid to late 2000s, uh, you know, we had an industry standard. But now what do we have? Choices. Now we have choices, right? <laughs> And so there was, and still is to some extent, in the, in the television industry in the United States, there's a bit of confusion, a bit of competition about which way are we going to go, all right? And so some stations uh, and networks said, ah, you know, we're going to stay with 480. And then some stations and networks, Disney, ABC, ESPN, et cetera, uh, the Disney family went with 720. CBS, for a time, uh, and probably still does do some of this, was 1080. So nothing was the same. Does that make sense? So 
Well, if you design a camera, if you design a camera, all of a sudden you have to do what? If you want that camera to be purchased by as many different people as possible, you have to design a camera that can do what? All of them, right? You have to design a camera that uh, can shoot 480 or 720 or maybe even 1080. Does that make sense? And so that makes it a lot more complicated for the camera manufacturers, but it also made it very complicated for the television manufacturers, right? Everybody in the United States is about to throw away their analog TVs, right? This is what everybody's thinking in the early 2000s. Wow, right? There's going to be probably somewhere along the lines of 400 million TV sets are going to be thrown away. And think about that. If you were a business person, would you be drooling? You should be, right? And so there was an awful lot of uh, competition as to who's going to be first, who's going to be first, who's going to be first. And Philips Magnavox was right on there in the money. But, but the folks that were able to build LCD panels and plasma screens that were switchable, in other words, they could receive 480 and show it to you. They could receive 720 and show it to you. They could receive 1080 and show it to you. If you had the processor engines that could handle the, these different types of input, that's essentially what started to happen is people would buy those types of TVs. Does that make sense? Now what I am starting to see though, what I am starting to see though, is that this particular resolution is not very popular. There's not a whole lot of content in 1080. There's a great deal of content, tons and tons of content in 720. All right, so Blu-ray, DVDs, Blu-ray, DVDs, 720. All right, 720. All right, so what is a line of resolution? Well, you really have to kind of draw yourself a TV set in your notes, draw yourself a TV set in your notes and draw lines and draw lines. Now what these are are lines of pixels. These are lines of pixels or rows, rows of pixels. And so as you might imagine, the more lines you cram in there, the more lines you cram in there, the better the resolution, the better the picture. Right? Does that make sense? So if you uh, quickly just turn around and take a look at that little Sony LCD panel behind you, you know, that's a very small little LCD panel. Uh, right now that is showing you uh, 720 lines. All right, this camera uh, right here is shooting at 720 th and that's showing you 720 lines. But that unit can also show you 480 lines. All right? But it's limited by that. By that. But imagine that screen with 1,080 lines. Would the picture be better? Of course. Right? Of course. So the more lines you have, the more lines of pixels you have, the better the picture the better the picture. Well, what's interesting is that the algorithms that have gone forward for UHD TV have been based off of 1080. All right, so the, the newest, latest, greatest thing, how many of you have heard of a standard called 4K? 4K, 4K, 4K this, 4K that, it's the newest, latest, greatest thing and uh, probably at Christmas time, you're going to see, or at the holidays uh, this year, you're going to be seeing a lot of advertising for 4K monitors. That's going to be the latest, greatest, newest thing that everything everybody must have are 4K monitors. Now, 4K, 4K is a bit weird in the sense that it's you know, somewhere north of 4,000 pixels or something like that. But 
if you go back to lines of resolution, the way we've been talking about it forever, how many lines is it? How many lines of pixels? I think that's actually more useful. And what it is, is a doubling of 1080. So it's 2,160. It's 2,160 lines of pixels. Does that make sense? So at the same time they're adding more lines, they're adding more pixels. And how do you add more pixels? Well, you essentially just make the pixels smaller. Right? You make the pixels smaller. But by adding in more lines, look at this jump. Look at this jump. 480 lines of resolution to 2,160 lines of resolution. And that has happened in less than 10 years. Anybody impressed? Or you guys are just going, oh yeah, well that's just the way the world is now, right? You think that's excessive? Guess what they just launched? Sharp Television at the National Association of Broadcasters meeting last year, so that would have been spring of uh, 15, just showcased another version of ultra high definition television and I think they're going to shoot some of the Olympics in Japan on it. It's called 8K. It's called 8K and if you think about lines of resolution as opposed to just the number of pixels, okay, uh, 8K is referring to the number of pixels, all right, but, but if you think about lines of resolution, which I think is more useful, especially when you're trying to think about this historically. Uh, well, what do you think that is? It's double that. So it's 4,000. Anybody want to do the math? 4,320. So now turn around and look at that little LCD panel and imagine 4,320 lines, right? It would look as good, if not better than, a photograph, right? So what's starting to happen is television is not only matching film, it is now exceeding film. And at some point, what's going to happen is, remember, your eyes are limited, right? Your eyes are limited. There is a limit to your sense of sight. And so at some point, video will get to the point where you can't tell the difference between looking at something that is actually in front of you and a video image of the same thing. Because I'll tell you something, 8K almost has a 3D effect. It's not 3D. They're not messing around with the colors to make it look 3D. It's quite literally reaching the point of true virtual reality video. So how long do you think it'll be until they hit 16K? <laughs> right? You know, 4K, 8K, 16K, and so on. Right? It all just depends on the processors. Now, who would like to have an 8K television for Christmas instead of a 4K? Well, sure, yeah, you, it's $125,000 for the monitor, okay? Uh, but I'll tell you something. You, you may be saying, oh, well, that's crazy, that's outrageous. The first high-definition television we bought at Northern Arizona University was somewhere north of 20,000. And that, and that one, that one, as I recall, that one could show you this, this, or this. And it was a plasma screen. And it was over 20 grand. It was like a huge investment. And there was only one of these on campus. And it was kept in almost like a clean room and people polished it every day. Uh, but the interesting thing is that content has not caught up. Okay, how much 4K content is there to watch? Not much, all right. How much 8K content is there to watch? Almost none. Okay, but will, will the industry eventually catch up? Absolutely. So the first way we talk about um, 
cameras is we talk about, remember that's really what we're talking about here is not TV sets but cameras, although they're related, is how many lines can this thing get? How, how many lines can it see? How many lines can it record? All right, and a general rule of thumb is, a general rule of thumb is that you record as high as you can. You record as high as you can because you can always down convert. Okay, you can always down convert. So if I shoot something, let's say in uh, 1080, can I down convert to 720? Sure. Can I down convert to 480? Yeah. And will I lose anything? Not. I'm not really. I'm losing lines of resolution, but uh, it's quite different from when you're trying to use an algorithm to go up. All right, because then what the computer's doing is creating information that was never actually recorded. So if you shot something in 480 and you want to up convert it to 720, okay, what's happening is the computer's going to use an algorithm to fill in the missing information. And so it's guessing, right? It never actually was recorded. So up converting, eh, not, it's not the best thing. Down converting? right? That works. So always shoot as high as you can. Always shoot as high as you can. All right. So, so we've got all these different resolutions out there. We've got all these different resolutions out there. Uh, and granted, you know, that's pretty much brand new. That's about a year old. Okay, that's about a year old. I think you're going to see 4K, this 2160 standard, that's probably going to take off. That's probably going to take off. Uh, and then we will probably say goodbye to a lot of this, all right? But remember, uh, how much television was shot in an analog world at 525 lines, 480 lines viewable? A lot, right? All the TV from essentially World War II up until the early 2000s was shot in standard definition. Are we just going to take all that and throw it away? No. Do people still like to watch old TV shows like I Love Lucy, which was shot on film, uh, or MASH, uh, Seinfeld? Do people still like to watch old shows? Absolutely. And so I think that your newer TVs might be able to show you 4K, but they will also still be able to show you something like 480. You follow that idea? All right, so lines of resolution, very important. So if you're a camera manufacturer, what do you want to do? You want to make your camera as flexible as possible. I want to shoot 480, I want to shoot 720, I want to shoot 1080, I want to shoot 4K, etc. Does that make sense? All right. The next way we talk about the image is the shape of the image. And we call this aspect ratio. Aspect ratio. And aspect, aspect ratio is really pretty simple. But aspect ratio has absolutely nothing to do with quality of the image. All right. The shape of the image. Yes. The quality of the image? No. All right. So forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, the standard aspect ratio, the standard shape of the picture was four to three. Four to three. Now you may say, well, what the heck does that mean, Utterback? Well, that means four units wide and three units deep. All right. Four units wide, three units deep. That, so this is the four, four wide, three down. That was the shape of the image in analog land from World War II forwards. Okay. And it was pretty much uh, the shape through the 2000s. And in fact, there's still a lot of video and television that is shot 4-3. All right, it's shot 4.3. But just because it's 4.3 doesn't mean that it's somehow low quality. Because can I cram 
720 lines in there? Sure. So remember something, aspect ratio quite simply is the shape of the image. It's the shape of the image. It's got nothing to do with the quality of the image or the resolution of the image. But what's the common one now? 16 by? Nope. 16 by 9. 16 by 9. And so, a 16 by 9 screen, this is what you guys are mostly uh, comfortable with or what mostly familiar with are 16 by 9 screens. That screen back there, that's a 16 9. That one over there and that little one that's on the stand, those are all 16 9. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the screen has been designed as 16 units wide and 9 units down. All right. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, why did they choose 16 by 9? Why didn't they choose something different? <laughs> you know, why 16 by 9? Well, again, we don't want to throw away all the wonderful television that was created from World War II up into the 2000s. We want to be able to still look at it, right? So, is this compatible? Is this compatible? And the answer is, well, of course it's compatible. Can you divide 16 by 4? Can you divide 9 by 3? Voila! That's why it was chosen, is because it's backwards compatible with this 4 by 3 standard, which we had forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, in the United States, guys, it's been very interesting because the FCC really kind of dropped the ball. Um, the FCC said back in the 90s, uh, you know, they said, you will be digital by 2007. You figure it out. That's really what, they, you will be digital. They did not say the new U.S. standard will be 16 by 9, 720 lines. They didn't give us a very strong statement of what the new standard was going to be, all right? Whereas back in the analog days, it was what? It's 525 lines, it's 4 by 3, everybody good? Sweet, go. And so all the camera manufacturers knew what to build, all the TV manufacturers knew what to build, right? And so if it seems like the United States has been a little bit slow in getting on the digital bandwagon, it's because we didn't have very good leadership <laughs> from the FCC, all right? Because I'll tell you something, if the FCC back in the 90s would have said, hey, you will be 720-16-9, everybody would have went, sweet, great, got it. Makes sense? Sort of. Did you know that they've had high-definition digital television in Japan since like 1985? Or maybe even earlier? Did you know that? And it took us what? 85, 95, 05, like 20 some odd years later. I mean, you have to imagine that the people in Japan were like, what's with the United States? Why are you guys so slow? You know, and part of the reason is we didn't ha really have very good leadership. All right, the other way that we talk about images is how they are refreshed. All right, how they are refreshed. Have you ever seen little itty bitty letters next to these numbers like P or I? Have you ever seen those little itty bitty tiny letters, P or I? Can anybody tell me what that is? What, what's that all about, P or I? No, it's, P, it's not pixels. Good guess. Interweave? Interleaves. Okay, you're on. You're on the right mark. You're on the right mark. So I'm going to erase aspect ratio because that's pretty much a no-brainer. Scan protocol. Scan protocol. Scan protocols. All right. A scan protocol, quite literally, is how we 
change from one image to the next image. All right. Who can tell me how many images make up one second of television? How many still images make up one second? We call this frames per second. 29.97, round that up for me. 30, okay, it's 30 FPS, all right? So a standard video, standard video, is 30 frames a second. Standard video is 30 frames a second. It's actually 29.97, but we're not gonna get into that, okay? If you wanna become an engineer, knock yourself out, all right? But 30 frames a second. Well, how do we change from, oh, by the way, before we do that, how many uh, pictures per second is a movie? A normal movie, when you go to watch a movie at the movie theater, how many FPS? What? No, it's not more, it's actually less. It's 24, it's 24. So the standard for film was, anyhow, just wanted, but, but there are film standards that are more, there are film standards that are more. Uh, uh, especially super high speed film like uh, IMAX, right? IMAX is above that. That's part of what makes IMAX so like, whoa, right? Uh, isn't IMAX awesome? It is awesome, come on. Mm -hmm. IMAX is awesome. I love going to IMAX movies. Um, all right, so 30 frames a second. How do we change from one picture to the next picture? That's what the scan protocol is all about, all right? And so I stands for interlace. Interlace scanning. Interlace scanning. Interlace, all right? And the analog standard, the analog standard, remember the 525 lines thing that I was talking about? The analog standard was 525i. All right, it was 525i. Got it? All right, but let's talk about what interlace means. If this is your TV set, and we are going to go to the next image, in the first half a second, in the first half a second, what happens is the odd numbered lines are replaced. In the first half second, the odd numbered lines are replaced. One, three, five, seven, nine, yada, 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 five, twenty-five. In the second half of the second, in the second half a second, <laughs> all right, the even lines are replaced. Two, four, six, eight, yada, 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 five hundred and twenty-four. Make sense? That's what an interlace scan is. But back in the uh, late 70s and into the early 80s, there was this new thing invented called a personal computer. Anybody know about those? Anybody ever hear of, oh, IBM, Apple, Microsoft, they wrote the software, yeah? Well, the computer monitors, the computer monitors, computer monitors were P, which stands for what? Progressive scan. Progressive scan. Progressive. Ugh. Progressive scan. So in a progressive scanning system, which all PCs are based on, in a progressive scanning system, the lines are replaced starting at the top and going to the bottom in one second. Okay, but it just starts at the top and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on until all the lines have been replaced. Does that make sense? And it all happens in one second. Does that make sense? So which one's better? P 
is more popular, but which one is better? Which one is actually refreshing more information faster? I is. I is refreshing. It's giving you more, inf- more new information faster. Okay? But the discovery was made that, you know, when you're actually shooting video of things that are moving, uh, like really fast, like say uh, Serena Williams' serve, right? Pow! You know, those things are going like over 120 miles an hour. Uh, or Tiger Woods decides to tee off, c- crack, you know, that ball is like, so wow! Makes sense. Things that are moving quickly, progressive scanning, it looks better. It's cleaner. You don't get any stutter with it. It's actually smoother looking. So, as you might imagine, a lot of the sports uh, folks thought, hey, you know, progressive is really better for sports because we have a lot of movement going on, especially things like things that are moving insanely fast, NASCAR, right? You know, the objects are moving by you at 225 miles an hour on the straights. You know, if you want a nice clean picture of it, progressive, it's going to look better. It's going to look better. Uh, So anyway, uh, what's really funny, how many of you have ever been watching TV? Uh, you ever been watching TV and you can, and the, the camera has a shot of a video, mo- or has a shot of a computer screen, and you can actually see the line on the computer screen? Progressive is slower, right? Interlace is faster. So what it means is they shot that in an inter- with an interlace camera. They shot it with an interlace camera, and they caught the refresh line. Does that make sense? Yes, no blank. All right, now, you tell me. If I have to, re- let's, let's stick with progressive scan because that's seemingly the default. Interlace is dying. 1080 is probably not going to catch on very much. And progressive scanning is going to be it. All right. But you tell me, how fast does your processor have to be to replace 480 lines in one second? Eh, it's got to be a pretty fast processor, right? How fast does your processor need to be if you're going to replace 2,160 lines in one second, right? You need to have a processor built into your television that is what? Hot dog boogie. Does that make sense? So the faster your TV is, the better. All right. So how many of you have ever seen when you're shopping for TVs, it says 60 hertz or 120 hertz or whatever, 240 hertz. That is referring to the speed of the television. All right. That's referring to the speed of the TV. So what do you want when you're out there buying a new TV for Christmas? What you want is something like a 4K TV, 2160 progressive scan. You want 16 by 9, and you want the fastest processor you can find, right? 120 hertz, so that that sucker is really cranking. Uh, And in fact, a lot of these processors have names. They have names, and uh, these are patented devices that the television manufacturers, Sony's uh, processor, for the longest time, have you ever heard of the word Bravia? Sony Bravia. Well, Bravia is the name of the processing engine, all right? That's what it is. That's what they're talking about. This this TV has a Bravia engine in it. It's sort of like saying, this car has a Hemi, all right? It's got a bigger engine in it. It's going to go faster. Makes sense, sort of, kind of. All right. The other thing these processors can do, which I think is kind of fascinating, is they read what they're getting. And they go, oh, I'm receiving a video game at this resolution, this aspect ratio, and it just goes and shows it to you. I'm receiving an old DVD. And it shows it to you. I'm receiving somebody's really old VHS tape that they shot at the beach in 1978, or 1982. And it shows it to you. Uh, So that's kind of nice that by waiting, by waiting, 
in the United States, so remember how I was sort of, you know, dissing the FCC a little bit? By waiting, we actually have TVs that can do more, that can show us more things. Isn't that cool? More flexibility. All right. Interlace versus progressive scanning. So we talk about these things in terms of resolution, aspect ratio, and scanning protocols. Questions about those three concepts? Questions about those three concepts? All right. Now, but remember that 4K is not talking about how many lines of pixels. It's talking about number of pixels. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, they actually have a wonderful set. I don't know who did the Wikipedia page on this, but it's actually really, really good. Uh, I, I'm hoping it was probably someone from the Society of Broadcasting Engineers that took the time to put that up, but it looks re it's excellent and it's very informative. And it will also give you standards from around the world, uh, which I think is also kind of uh, uh, valuable. It's valuable. All right, so let's go to the cameras now. Uh, draw a line in your notes. We're going to talk about all the pieces parts. We're going to talk about pieces parts. All right. This part of the camera here, that's called the viewfinder. That's called the viewfinder. The viewfinder. The viewfinder. And the viewfinder has a little itty bitty TV set. It has a little itty bitty TV set. It's a little tiny LCD panel. And it's essentially just showing you what the camera can see. All right. It's just showing you what the camera is looking at. It's just a little LCD panel. And it can be adjusted in a hundred billion different ways in terms of brightness and contrast and things like that. It can also be uh, adjusted to show you spots that are overexposed or even underexposed and whatnot. Does that make sense? But it's just the viewfinder. When the camera is on, the viewfinder is on. The viewfinder is receiving its power from the camera. It's not sort of a separate thing with its own separate power and its own separate batteries or anything. It is attached, all right? On the front of the viewfinder, on the front of the viewfinder is a little white light. You see that? This little light up here? Does anybody know what that's called? What's that light? It's called the tally light. It's called the tally light, T-A-L-L-Y, T-A-L-L-Y. And when the tally light is lit up, when the tally light is lit up, what it means is that is the camera that's hot, that's live, the camera that is selected in the program bus on the video switcher. So the tally light is useful so that the talent know which camera is actually on. Does that make sense? So the floor director is going to be pointing them, hopefully, to the correct camera. The floor director is going to be pointing them to the correct camera, but at a glance, anybody in the studio will know which camera's hot and which ones are not. But tally lights have an on-off switch. Tally lights have an on-off switch. So you can actually turn that function off. You can turn that function off it will force your anchors to actually pay attention to the floor director. But uh, the reason that we turn off the tally lights is let's say you're at a football game uh, or a soccer game or anything else where you have a crowd or an audience and you don't want the audience to know which camera is on, shut the tally light system off and that way they don't know if you're hot or not and they will behave themselves. Because more often than not what happens is when an audience sees that red light go on, what do they do? I'm on TV. I'm on the Jumbotron. You know, and it's just like, okay. If you want people to go crazy, fine. Turn the tally light on. They will. Okay. Below that, you have your camera body. Below that, you have your camera body. The camera body. 
camera body. And uh, the camera body contains the imaging chips. The camera body contains the imaging chips that actually create the video image. A professional grade camera has three imaging chips. A professional grade camera has three imaging chips. Three chip, three chip camera. That's pro, all right? That's professional, okay? And these chips are called CMOS chips. CMOS. CMOS. CMOS chips. And I always have, I can never remember the entire thing because it's so long. So I have to have my little cheat card. You ready for this? Complimentary. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Complementary metal oxide semiconductor. It's an imaging chip. Okay. Built onto that chip uh, is essentially what, what's called an active pixel sensor or an APS an active pixel sensor. Uh, again, if you jump online, you'll see a picture of a CMOS chip, and you can actually see the APS. It's really pretty cool looking. Uh, and all that is is your imaging chip. It's what converts light into an image. All right? It's what's converting the light into an image. Okay? Uh, but I said that we have three chips. We have three of these CMOS chips in a professional grade camera. One is reading red, one's reading green, the other one is reading anyone? Red, green, and blue. So uh, your video image is created by mixing red, green, blue, black, and white. All right, now, how many of you have a camera like on your iPad or on an iPhone or something like that? Uh, you don't have three chips, you have one. And that one chip has been divided in such a way that one portion of it's reading red, one portion of it's reading green, the other portion is reading blue. Does that make sense? All right. But those are called one chip cameras. And that's what sort of separates professional stuff from consumer stuff is, is how many chips you've got. Uh, that you're dealing with. All right, CMOS. Uh, CMOS is also used in uh, anybody uh, shooting with DSLRs? Anybody? DSLRs? Yeah, well, they're CMOS. Uh, they're CMOS chips, okay? But that's what's inside of the camera body. On the front of the camera, on the front of the camera, underneath of this hood is your camera lens. The camera lens. The camera lens. Uh, now, believe it or not, when you buy a camera, it does not come with a lens. When you buy a camera, it does not come with a lens. Uh, you have to buy it separately. You have to buy it separately. Uh, and the reason for that is because they don't know what you're going to do with the camera, <laughs> right? And generally speaking, uh, you know, you buy lenses for what you anticipate you're going to be using it for. Does that make sense? Uh, what, what do you think is more expensive, the lens or the body? The lenses are always more expensive than the bodies. Bodies are, there's an awful lot of manufacturers that build camera bodies, all right? Because robots can build these things. Um, but camera lenses, camera lenses, the glass inside is, a lot of it still hand ground and hand checked and there's probably only about four or five lens manufacturers in the world all right and that's why lenses are so expensive is there's a lot of hand work hand checking to make sure that they're all tuned up and working properly 
and there's just that, not that many manufacturers. A lot more difficult to build a lens than it is to build the camera body. The length of the lens indicates how far it can see. So a long All right, it's on the center of gravity, <clears throat> and so it's the safest spot to apply force, to move it or pull it or whatever to push it, pull it, whatever you're going to do with it. All right. Now, the lower part here, I'm going to show you something, has a 
that goes up and down. That's the pedestal column. That's the pedestal column. The pedestal column. All right, so we've got the head, the steering wheel, the column. All right. Then this part down here where you have the legs and struts and the wheels, the legs, the struts, and the wheels. This part of the pedestal is called the pedestal dolly. That part down there, that is the pedestal dolly. D-O-L-L-Y. The pedestal dolly. Pedestal dolly. Ah, it's got wheels on it. You can dolly. Okay. Dollying is moving. All right. Uh, now, some people call pedestals dollies. Some people call the whole thing a dolly. But you can tell them that Professor Rutterbeck said no, 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 no. Unless they're the, unless they're your boss, okay. But once you're the boss. Sorry, kid. It's not a dolly. It's a pedestal. And the dolly part is this bottom part. All right. Uh, back here, you've got two handlebars. You've got two handlebars on the back. Left stick and right stick. Left stick and right stick. Those are attached into the pedestal head. Those are attached into the pedestal head. And the handlebars are important because that's where your lens controls are mounted. Your lens controls are mounted on your sticks. The lens controls are mounted on the sticks. Left stick, focus. Left stick is focus. Right stick, servo zoom. That's your zoom control. Left stick is focus. Right stick, zoom. And I don't care if you're in London or Sydney, Australia, or Timbuktu. Left stick, focus, right stick, zoom. Got it? Yes, no blink? All right, cool. Now, one of the things about cameras, which is kind of wild, is they have a hundred bajillion locks. So, before you can actually operate this thing, you have to unlock it. All right, so let's talk about some of these locks. Every studio pedestal, every tripod, is going to have the following two locks. You're going to have a tilt lock and a pan lock. You're going to have a tilt lock and a pan lock, and you're going to have to find them. Sometimes they color code them for you. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they label them for you. Sometimes they don't but you know that they're there. There's a tilt lock and a pan lock. So if the camera won't tilt up and down and it won't pivot left and right, tilt lock and pan lock. So on ours, on this Cartoni, the tilt lock is located on the left side of the head. It's this lever right here. It's a bolt, okay? All you gotta do is loosen it and now the unit should Tilt up and down. All right, nice and smooth. So, if you go to tilt, it won't tilt, it won't tilt. Don't push harder. Don't push harder. If the camera is giving you any resistance at all, it's yelling at you. It's saying, please stop. You're about to damage me. Please don't damage me. You're doing something wrong. Operator error, operator error, right? Tilt lock. Just does, you don't have to spin the bolt all the way out until it goes ta ting 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 across the floor. Just make it loose and now it'll pivot up and down. Right? The pan lock is located up underneath. It's this lever right here. You see where my hand is? That lever is the pan lock. And when it's undone, when it's undone, 
the camera will now pivot left and right. Okay, it's going to pivot nice and neat. The wheels aren't turning, right? The wheels aren't turning and it's pivoting left and right and it's tilting up and down. Is everybody happy? Yes. Good. Now, I'm going to engage the tilt lock. Uh, the column has a lock on it. The column has a lock on it. And on this one, it's actually labeled. Let's spin this around. On this one, it's actually labeled. It says column lock. All right. But the column lock is used when you get the camera at the height you want it. If you want it to stay there permanently, you engage that column lock. Okay, you engage it by just simply tightening it up. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Okay, so if I tighten it up, it won't go up and down. All right, if I leave it open, if I leave it unlocked, the camera doesn't fall. It doesn't fall because, because the pedestal is a pneumatic pedestal. There's actually air under pressure. Uh, inside of that. It's pneumatic, just like a tire. In fact, uh, somewhere around here, see this bicycle pump? Looks like a bicycle pump, right? Yeah, that's how we get air into that. Because occasionally they leak a little bit. <laughs> uh, also changes in uh, atmospheric pressure, we'll mess around with them. Uh, so anyway, listen, um, you can leave that column lock unlocked and the camera will stay. All right. So generally speaking, I don't use it all that much. Uh, there's also a ring lock, which is kind of like a parking brake or a parking lock. You see that red thing right there that my fingers on? Can you all see that? When I pull, it's a spring loaded deal. When I pull that over and bring this all the way down, it's designed to keep the camera parked. All right, so when we put cameras away, you bring the columns down, you lock them all up nice and tight. Okay. Then there are four, or four, there's three wheel locks, three wheel locks, and the wheel locks are located on the wheel. Do you see this lock here that looks almost exactly like that one? Do you see those two? How they look almost exactly the same? The wheel lock locks the wheel. This is something entirely different that you should really not need. All right? I'll tell you what it is. It's a directional lock. So if you want to turn this thing into kind of like a choo-choo train, you get your wheels all kind of going in the same direction, and then you pop these down. And they're going to lock in a plane. They're going to lock into a plane. And now it's kind of like this thing is on rails. It's kind of like it's on rails. So if I try to push it that way, those wheels are not going to pivot. See? So it's almost like that camera is locked on rails. So it locks the camera wheels on a plane. But you'd be surprised how many people will grab a camera like this and go, it's not moving this way. It's not moving the direction I want. And they start pushing harder on it. Why isn't it moving the direction I want? And the next thing you know, you got 40,000 bucks on the ground. If the, ca the camera's yelling at you, stop. You're about to break me. Please don't break me. Make sense? Never force anything. Take your time. Be patient. Even if you have a director yelling at you to hurry up, it's not worth breaking a piece of equipment. Okay? All right. So I'm going to give you some basic camera commands. Uh, essentially, the camera operators are going to be on an intercom headset. All right? And so this is how you will hear the director. You'll hear the director talking to you. The director is not going to use your name. The director is going to call you by your camera number. So this is camera one. 
and the director would say, hey, camera one. You know? He's talking or she's talking to you. All right, so camera one, tilt up. Camera one, tilt up means show me what's up. All right, camera one, tilt up. Show me what's up. Camera one, tilt down. Show me what's down. Camera one, pan left. Show me what is to your left. Make sense? Camera one, pan right. Show me what is to your right. You'd be surprised how many of you are going to screw this up. Remember that. Show me what's up. Show me what's down. Show me what is to your left. Show me what is to your right. Okay, because to show what's to my right, I'm actually using my left hand. Does that make sense? That's why people get confused. So, tilt up, tilt down, pan left, pan right. And by the way, never stop until the director tells you to. All right? Uh, camera one, pan left. A little more. A little more. A little more. Uh-uh. Just keep going until they tell you to stop. Camera one, pan right. Nice and smooth. And hold. Camera one, tilt up. And hold. We don't want a lot of stuttering, okay? And the director really doesn't want to have to talk to you twice. Really, okay? Uh, so go until they tell you to stop. And always make a move as if you are live. You want to be as steady and smooth as possible. All right? Unless the director specifically says, camera one, you are clear, and I need you to pan left like really totally fast. Then you can go really quick. Does that make sense? So otherwise, always imagine that you're on. Uh, camera one, dolly in means move the whole mess forward. Camera one, dolly out. Move the whole mess out. Dolly in, dolly out. Now remember dollying is a move, right? Camera one, dolly in, dolly out. What do you think to go left and right? No, it's not a dolly. What is it? I'm wondering if anybody's done their reading for the day. Because it was in the book. Anyone? Nope, sorry. What is it? Truck. Truck. Truck left. Truck right. Lucky guess. Nah, you knew it? Awesome. Truck left, you get a gold star. Truck left, truck right. Truck left, truck right. Dolly in, dolly out, truck left, truck right. Okay? The other thing the uh, director is going to want you to do is set your focus. Okay? So the cameras do not, they have the capability to go autofocus, but we don't do that. Uh, so one of the things they're going to want you to do is set your focus. So let me show you what that looks like. Take a look at the LCD panel behind you. Go ahead, take a look at the LCD panel, and I'll show you how to set your focus. It's really pretty easy. You zoom into the eyeball of your talent, zoom into the eye of your talent until the camera won't zoom anymore, and turn that focus controller until the image is nice and crisp. Go for the eye because the eye has a lot of detail in it. And now what you have done is you have set the focus on the camera. Everything between the lens, keep looking, everything between the lens and my subject is in focus. Does that make sense? All right. So. Anytime your subject moves away from you or towards you, reset your focus. 
anytime you move away or towards your subject, reset your focus. Yeah. How do they do that for sports? How do you do it for sports? You actually set your focus on something that's beyond. Like, let's say I'm doing a NASCAR race and it's a big track, right? I'll set my focus on something that's way beyond the things that I want. Does that make sense? So I'll pick a tree like way out there, set my focus on the tree and then back out. Everything between the tree and me stays in focus. You follow that? And if they're handheld, won't they sort of deride the focus? If you're handheld, yeah, you can sort of go on your own yeah. with it. Yeah. You can have presets, yeah. You can have presets, but I would rather just, it's faster just to set it. Does that make, rather than, oh, which pre, is it preset one, preset two, preset three? Which one? I forget, right? All right. So that's cameras, guys. Next week, we are doing our first laboratory.